Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin our study here. And uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for this day, for the time we have to open your word together. And we need your direction and understanding in these things. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you can help us um, put these judges upon a line, that we can understand this line clearly and that we can share it with others, and that this movement can see how you have been leading and what you are saying to us. Help us to walk in the light that you give us. May your Holy Spirit bring conviction and power in our lives, that we can uh, confess and repent of our sins, and that you can use us to your glory. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning. And uh, we're going to continue this study on Jephthah. Now, just to do a bit of a review. So we know that um, Judges, the book of Judges, we are making an application of the book of Judges to our time from 9-11 to 2023, based on Judges chapter 2, verse 1 to 23. And we've gone through Judges, uh, this is the third time, basically, that we're going through the book of Judges, and we're placing Judges on a line. And um, in Judges chapter 11, we have the story of Jephthah. So he's uh, a judge who is the son of a harlot, and we're taking that Jephthah represents the message related to chronology, specifically related to chronology, that's going to um, support November 9th, 2019, and give us July 18, 2020. But it does represent all of this analytical chronology, including the symbolic use of numbers. Now, this judge Jephthah, is a waymark in the line of the judges. And that waymark we have marked is December 6, 2020. So when we zoom into the story of Jephthah, what we find is Jephthah is going to represent um, that history of that chronology that is then rejected on December 6, 2020. So that's how we've understood it. And we've gone through Jephthah, and um, we've got up to 1111, where we can say that this is this doubling of this 1111. And so we're going to look at the, the chart here, but in a minute. But Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mitzvah. So the way that we look at this, so I'm going to go here to this line and try to explain this again and see if this makes sense. So when we look at Jephthah as a line, he on the line of the judges, he's the way mark that we mark is December 6, 2020. But this line of Jephthah is going to be, we zoom into that way mark and we get this line. And this line is going to address time in this movement that is then going to be rejected on December 6, 2020. So we know uh, the declaration that FFA made on December 6th was a rejection of this message of time that uh, we're marking as June 22nd, 2014. That is specifically uh, the use, the symbolic use of dates. So we know on June 22nd, 2014, we had this camp meeting uh, in which Noel uh, presented the first day of the first month and the first day of the fifth month and the 10th day of the seventh month that had first been, uh, we began to examine in the summer of 2013. So it took a, took a year until we had this all counted out. Now I had done this on August 31st 2013 but I wasn't really uh, 
you know, wasn't being published or shown to anyone, really. Um, so I just had prepared this, that structure that basically Noel did. His was a little more detailed, a little more refined than mine was, but I understood the principles behind it because I understood how the Jewish calendar worked. And I knew that it was uh, 30 and 29 days. Um, and so that uh, we could mark the first day of the fifth month. Now, <clears throat> um, so that's going to be June 22nd, 2014. Now, then I'm going to mark October 22, 2014. And that's going to be this camp meeting uh, where we have, uh, uh, I present chronology in Arkansas for the first time on the 20, 20th. I do one presentation, and on the 21st, I do two. It's called called the three-part uh, presentation. And uh, that's going to be this uh, in Judges 11, verse 5 to 10. That's going to be the story of them going to fetch Jephthah. And then finally in 11, 11, uh, he's going to go with them. So... So the first part from Judges uh, 11, verse 5 to 10 is going to be them uh, negotiating with him, going to fetch him and negotiating with him. And then Judges 11, 11, he's going to go with them. So we're saying that this is the formalization of the message. Now we're marking October 22, 2014. Um, now we do have... Uh, you know, there, there could be other events that we could mark. Um, but what we're doing is we're addressing the presentations or the symbols um, that are presented. Now, October 22, of course, I don't present anything. Uh, that's going to be the Wednesday. So it's just the middle of the camp meeting that I'm marking, that midst of that week um, that I'm marking with the October 22 date. So it's going to be the Wednesday and it's literally the center of the camp meeting. And then um, we have January 11th. So Judges 11 is going to be uh, marking two way marks, the empowerment of the first message and the arrival of the second. So January 11th, 2020, there's this presentation that's done by Daniel Fontenot. And um, that presentation is, uh, let me see if I can find it here again. Um, yeah, we have it uh, on our, on the, the horizontal tree, I believe is where we put it. Yeah, so, that is um, there. It's Approaching Doom, Part 5 by Daniel Fontenot on January 11th, 2020. And then Jeff is going to follow uh, with a presentation that's going to be March 31st, 2020. And he's going to present this structure, what we call the Levitical chiasm, the latter part of it at least. Uh, the 63 days from um, uh, November 9th, 2019, being January 11th, 2020. And that's going to be part of 126 days from September 7th, 2019. So, so we have these two way marks that are Judges 11, 11. One's the empowerment and one's the arrival. And of course, we see the same thing in our lines when it comes to 9-11, uh, though in some ways it's switched. The 9-11 becomes a symbol. And um, so 11-9 and 9-11 sort of go together. Now with 11-11, we have all of these symbols that relate to the patriarchs, the 22 generations that are 11 to the flood and 11 afterwards we have to go into Egypt. And then we have um, uh, in the story of Joseph, the 11 years, and then the dream of the butler and baker after 
um, Joseph's dream, and then 11 years later, the dream is fulfilled. Joseph's dream is, but the butler and baker's dream are essential in order for Joseph's dream to be fulfilled. So if he hadn't interpreted their dream, he wouldn't have interpreted Pharaoh's dream, and his dream wouldn't have been fulfilled. Um, and then, of course, we have Daniel 11, 11. So that becomes uh, an important symbol because that's going to be raphia. That becomes a part of our movement. And if we look at um, different lines, we're going to see that that Daniel 11, 11 is going to be a formalization of a message. Now, Jephthah is the formalization of the second message, which aligns with midnight. So Jephthah represents midnight as well. But in, in the line that we were looking at with the judges, that's December 6, 2020 is then technically midnight or raffia you know, on an internal line, which is what this line is about. So any questions so far about what we're saying about this line or any observations? That's just kind of a review of where we got to. So then we have to get from this second message arriving on March 31st, 2020, and to get to December 6, 2020. So we have a date that we would mark as the formalization of this message and the date that we would mark as its empowerment. So in order to do that, we really need to understand what this light is that is given on March well, on January 11th, 2020, uh, recognizing that. And that's, that's basically arrives when Jeff recognizes this light on March 31st, 2020. So we now have a message. This message is going to be rejected when the third angel arrives. At least that's how we've set up this line. Now, we, we might have something else. We might even say, you know, December 6th is the empowerment or something. But this is just how we've set up these lines. They're not set in stone because this line is addressing December 6th on the line of, of the judges. So let's look at the verses themselves and see what we can do with this. So it says, and Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, what hast thou to do with me that thou art come against me to fight in my land? So remember, what's going to happen here is that Jephthah is going to, to have this discussion, you know, through these messengers, with the king of the children of Ammon. And it's going to be about... Uh, why are you even having this, this disagreement with us? Why are you coming to fight against us? Because we didn't do anything to you. And uh, the king of Ammon, he's going to go back and rehearse a history in somewhat a distorted fashion. He says, um, Israel, uh, so, so he says here, um, Israel took away my land, this is verse 13, when they came up out of Egypt from Arnon even unto Jabbok and unto Jordan. Now, therefore, restore those lands again peaceably, peaceably. Now, did he do this? Did the children of Israel take away the lands of the children of Ammon? Mm, I don't think so. Or maybe, wait, yes, they did take it away. But that was several hundred or a couple hundred years earlier, wasn't it? Okay. So it, it's kind of, <clears throat> it's an interpretation of history that is 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 inaccurate, right? So the, the king of the children of Ammon, um, he's, he's a re hist historical revisionist. Um, so just to kind of 
put it in somebody else's words. Okay. So I'm going to read this here. This is just from a commentary, and it can help give us some background. Okay, Jephthah's negotiations with the king of the Ammonites. Before Jephthah took the sword, he sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites to make complaints to him of his invasion of the land of the Israelites. What have we to do with one another? What to me and thee? That thou hast come to fight against my land. Jephthah's ambassador speak in the name of the nation, hence the singular is me and my land. The king of the Ammonites replied that when Israel came up out of Egypt, they had taken away his land from Arnon to the Jab Jabbok, that's on the north side, and to the Jordan on the west, and demanded that they should now restore those lands in peace, right? And we're going to look at that numbers uh, 21. They're going to mention it here. Um, the plural, anyway, I'm going to skip some of this because he deals a lot with the Hebrew and stuff. The claim raised by the king of the Ammonites has one feature in it, which appears to have a certain color of justice. The Israelites, it is true, had only made war upon the king of the Amorites, Sihon and Og, and defeated them and taken possessions of their kingdoms and occupied them without attacking the Ammonites and Moabites and Edomites because God had forbidden their attacking these nations. But one portion of the territory of Sihon had formerly been Moabitish and Ammonitish property and had been conquered by the Amorites and occupied by them, according to Numbers 2126. So that's what Angela is referring to there. So Numbers 2126 um, says, For Heshbon was the city of Sihon, well, just can have verse 26, uh, the city of Sihon, the king of the Amorites, who had fought against the former king of Moab and taken all his land out of his hand and even unto Arnon. So, so that means they took over land, which was Ammonitish land, but it had first been conquered uh, uh, by um, uh, here the conquered by the Amorites, right? So the Amorites had taken this Moabitish and Ammonitish territory. So I guess indirectly, um, they had taken some land that was theirs, but it was first dispossessed by the Amorites. So when the Israelites conquered the Amorites, they had taken over this land. Okay, so that makes sense. So that's, that's the argument that he's presenting. Um, but uh, Jephthah is going to respond. He says, thus saith Jephthah, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness unto the Red Sea and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers unto the king of Edom, saying, let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. But the king of Edom would not hearken thereto. And like manner, he, they sent unto the king of Moab, but he would not consent. And Israel abode in Kadesh. Then when they went along through the wilderness, encompassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab, and came by the east side of the land of Moab, and pitched on the other side of Arnon, but came not within the border of Moab, for Arnon was the border of Moab. And Israel sent messengers unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, and the king of Heshbon. And Israel said unto him, Let us pass, we pray thee, through thy land into my place. But Sihon trusted not Israel to pass through his coast, and Sion gathered all his people together and pitched to Jahaz and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all the people into the land of into the hand of Israel, and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country. And they possessed all the coasts of the Amorites from Arnon even unto Jabbok, and from the wilderness unto Jordan. So now the Lord God of Israel hath dispossessed the Amorites from before his people. And shouldest thou possess it? Wilt not thou possess that which Chemosh thy God giveth thee to possess? So whomsoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, then we will possess. So you can see his argument, right? Now that makes more sense. Um, so now when we look at, at this uh, and we're trying to make an application, what is this negotiation? How would we symbolize that in our history? So first we have to remember who 
or what does the king of Ammon represent? How did we look at these different symbols? Anybody remember what we did yesterday? So we had, remember, we had Jephthah. Uh, he's a, Gilead, a Gileadite, right? And Gilead, uh, wife, bear him sons. So there's this church. The woman represents a church. And so, um, so we have Gilead, who's going to be uh, connected to the church. So what, what did Gilead represent? How did we do, deal with that? Sorry, haven't transcribed my notes yet. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? You don't remember. Okay, let's let's think this through. <clears throat> so we know that Jephthah is thrust out, and he's going to be thrust out um, by the sons of Gilead. And we know that the wife, she represents the church. That's going to be Adventism. This is going to be a truth that. And that is they're opposed to time, time setting, the symbolic use of numbers. Yeah, it's beginning to come back. Okay. Okay. So, so these are messages that are opposed to time setting within the movement. You know, people are always attached uh, to messages as well. Okay. So Gilead refers to a message that is related to the rejection of time, is how we worded it yesterday. Okay. So we have this, this message that's related to the rejection of time. Uh, so who are the children of Ammon that make war against Israel? Those who are opposed to time setting or, you know, even if it's based on Paul, Paul Moni, regard those who present new wine as offshoots. I know I face that and are, are looking at the past. They're misconstruing the past and they're bearing grudges. OK, well, so if we have the Gileadites are those that oppose time and they're having a war with the children of Ammon. Um, how does that fit in? Because we have this conflict between these two. Ammon was an illegitimate, I mean, I'm sorry, he was a product of incest, right? Yeah, it's one of Lot's sons. One of Lot's sons. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't remember. Yeah, after the destruction of Sodom. Yeah. 
so we have this this fight so we're we're going to have um they're going to, they're going to thrust out and that is going to be the the sons of the wife are going to thrust out Jephthah so Jephthah is a message related to time but they're going to call him back because of this war against Ammon so how do we fit that together? So how do we how do we resolve this? Well, if, if Gilead was a uh... A message was an am and a message as well. Well, yeah, these are all messages. So, what is the message? Um, and why are we, we going to call? Why is those that thrust out the message of time? Why are they going to address time? So, we have here that the children of Ammon would be Parminder and Tess. Their message, right? right. Right, that's what we determined. Yeah. So there's a war going on. This is a war going on within the movement. Yeah. So Ammon, in a sense, is a relative. Right. These, these aren't the, the Canaanite nations. These are relatives. And, and, and they're going to come war against Israel. So they're going to come war against this message, Right. So right. And with this other message. And this message is um, it's a deceptive message, right? So there's this negotiating going on, and it's it's a deceptive negotiating. Right? It's right. history. So which was also uh P and T's um, uh, modus operandi. Right. So there were things that were kind of true, and, and it's kind of interesting how it says um, in this commentary, because it's not really addressing our history, but it appears to have a certain color of justice, is what it says in the commentary. Um, right, so I just want to show you that. Right, it's right here, which appears... The claim raised by the king of the Ammonites has one feature in it in which it appears to have a certain color of justice. Would we say that about Tess and Parminder's message? Absolutely. Right. So if you just take what they say, it seems to be just, but it's deceptive. It's mixed with truth and error. Right. It's a mixture of truth and error. They leave out details. It's revisionist history. And... And so we saw that with Tess, how she was using uh, or really misusing the history of the movement and, um, and, and coloring things in such a way that it seemed to make sense, but it wasn't truth because it was mixed with air. And so there's this negotiating going on in a sense that is there is this conflict this uh conflict of visions or of ideas that's going to be presented and and this conflict was going on for a long time even before i realized it was going on that is parminder was seeking to undermine everything that i was doing with chronology and time the only thing that i found very odd was when parminder saw me present the 391.5 days from noon October 13th to noon uh, or to midnight commencing November 9th uh, 2019 so from October 13th 2018 he actually created an opportunity for me to do two presentations at the camp meeting which uh, was going to be starting in a couple of days so that was on the 14th 
I think the camp meeting started on the 16th. So he, he made sure I had not just the two days I had to present uh, the week of Christ study, but he gave, he, he got Jeff to give me two more days. Um, I think he actually gave up his time so that I could present that. Now, what I think happened is that Parminder initially was persuaded by what I had done. And in Providence, in God's Providence, he just set aside his, his sort of, he thought this must work into, he, he saw that it was true, right? This wasn't something that could have been made up. But later, Tess is going to reject this. And so Tess doesn't accept the 391.5. She told me that herself in 2019. She says, I don't think that this is correct. Which I was kind of surprised at. And, and it's kind of interesting, too, because um, the 391.5 also relates to um, uh, Tess and uh, AOC, her hero, because AOC is born on noon, October 13th, uh, <clears throat> 1989, and, and Tess is born, let me see, how's that go? Yeah, and Tess is born on November 9th, uh, 1990, 1990. So... <clears throat> So it's kind of interesting that they're 391 and a half days apart. She's also an 11.9? Yeah, she's an 11. Yeah, so she's an 11.9, Tess is, and, and October 13th is AOC. So AOC is 391 and a half days older than Tess. I don't know if Tess knows this, has ever done the calculation, but she should have been able to figure it out. But anyway, you know, so we have this, this conflict that's going on in the movement, right? Um, so, so the movement that has, and remember, this is the sons of Gilead, right? That are going to thrust out Jephthah. Now, now Jephthah is also a son of Gilead, but illegitimate. Right. So the idea is that Gilead represents the the teaching in Adventism that's opposed to time setting. And so Jephthah is a message that doesn't follow the understanding of the church of scholarship and how we relate to the symbolic use of numbers. We would see that in Adventism as numerology. Right. Mysticism. But we know that all Adventists accept to some degree the symbolic use of numbers, if we accept 666 as a symbol, and 888, and, and different things, the number 7, the number 3, the number 12, we, we all accept it to some degree. But when we applied it to dates the way that we did, is something that no one would do, because they would see that as outside the Bible. So... So now we have this negotiating going on. And so this has to be represented somehow in our history. Now, are there any symbols that we can pick up in these, in these verses, in what's being said, um, that can help tie us to some dates in our history that would be significant? Yeah, so the could this refer to the pretended interest by Bronwyn and others of discussing uh, the line times together just before the usurpers issued their uh, December 6, 2020 anathema? Yes. So, so one of the things that we see is that this negotiating going on is not with Parminder and Tess particularly. Right? This negotiating going on is primarily because it's going to be after March 31st, 2020. So the battle has been with, that is, they're fighting against Parminder and Tess's message. And they're using, let's look 
at it this way. This is quite simple. They have no interest in July 18, 2020, but they have a personal vendetta. Let's say just take Bronwyn. She has a personal vendetta against Tess and Parminder, correct? So would Bronwyn and others have picked up on July 18th and promoted it, except that with, without it being something that was opposing Parminder and Tess. The reason why they picked it up is they're opposed to Parminder and Tess, and Parminder and Tess are opposed to July 18th. So it's something they pick up in this battle. Does that make sense to people? I know I'm not saying it well. I was trying to say it simply. But can we see the motivations of why people are going to pretend interest in this? It's, it's a part of a personal battle that they're having. And this seems like something convenient in that battle, a convenient weapon in that battle against Parminder and Tess and their influence. They're just playing Paul. Politics? Is that what you said? You got cut off too yeah, soon. It's, it's a game. I can see that game being played. I right. see it all the time. I'll watch certain politicians. Yeah. So on the one hand, they, they accept this, but they have no interest in me having any influence in pre presenting during this time. Right? Because there is this, just like they did dislike Parminder and Tess for the reason of power, I am seen as a threat to their power, right? I mean, that's one of the problems we see in the movement in particular, that the people are territorial, right? People are political. Can we, that's apparent. Yeah. And, and, and this shouldn't be, right? Because uh, we're all brethren, right? The truth is what matters. We are supposed to be working with Christ. And this was a problem in Adventist history as well. You know, whose side are you on? The party spirit. People aren't just interested in truths for truth's sake. It's, it's personal position and power and influence. The idea that somehow my idea is if, if I'm in control, then things are going to go the way that I want. Where instead of realizing that if God is in control. Hello, there it comes. Yeah, that things are going to go the way that God wants, and that's much better than what I want, right? And what we should be seeking is what is God's will for us? What is it that we should be doing? What is God asking us to do? What is he telling us to do? And so, you know, we see this even presently in the movement that there is, it's not about just, well, let's look at everything and understand it and find out what God wants, because we believe that other people are maneuvering and positioning and that we have to sort of fight against it. So this is what I experienced at the school of the prophets was for instance, with the November 22nd, a 2018 study of, that date would mean, of, of what that date would mean that they brought up. Well, other groups are trying to, had tried to do what you're doing. They basically accused us of political motives that we were, seeking uh, to get followers, which of course is the farthest thing from the truth. Um, so, you know, so it was just like, we could see it was all this political stuff and suspicion and intrigue and, 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 and it, to me, it's always sat wrong with me to politics. It should have nothing to do with the truth. Uh, we should be interested in the truth. And, and we see that today in the world, right? What it, where do people decide what is true? Well, does it fit with your party line? And it's pretty hard for people to step outside of that. Um, so how you're going to look at any of the events happening in the world today is going to de depend upon your political perspective. So the facts, the facts are subordinate to your politics. And that's what was happening in the movement here. So, so we could say that this negotiating is with a, a message 
that is opposed to um, to time, right? And so this is going on in the movement. We see this. Uh, this would uh, well illustrate what what was happening. So this is the message of Parminder and Tess, and we know in the end that that is going to be um, the message that is. Um, is is promoted Parminder and Tess's view of July 18th and everything that we did. I mean, they make the same arguments that Parminder and Tess made against July 18th. They just wait till after July 18th has failed. And, you know, and it's also crazy when you think about it, because a lot of this was a battle over the property in the school of the prophets and, and FFA and all these things, these, um, the institutional aspect, right? Because Parminder and Tess wanted to take over the movement, but they wanted the buildings, right? They wanted the, the School of the Prophets. They wanted Lambert Church. And, and of course, they didn't get that. And so there was this, this battle going on that really... Um, in the end, they still lost it all, right? I mean, they may have ended up with the money from it, but, you know, the whole school of the prophets and all those things are all gone. And, you know, things could have been done differently after July 18th. This movement would be stronger and it would be united, right? But it wasn't. Well, we've seen in the sale of all that stuff, all the symbology of... Mm -hmm. uh, the 187, for instance, and yeah. um, the, the timing and whatnot. So it, that's, to me, that's God's putting his, uh, his signature on these things. Yeah. That this is, this is what will happen. Yeah. Well, exactly. So we, we can see God's leading in it. I mean, the fact that the School of the Prophets is sold 187 days after July 18th, and it sold at 18.7% uh, below what the asking price was. Um, I mean, those are pretty remarkable uh, coincidences. It's like a thumbprint. And it was also listed 187 days before July 18th, uh, 2021. Uh, Right. So. Um, so there's all of this symbolism. Uh, so do you think that's God mocking them? Um, I don't know. I, I wouldn't look at it that way. I would just think it's God giving us a witness showing that they were. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I, I don't think that God will mock until really the end. But anyway, but that's a whole other story because that's a. Uh, to understand the symbolism of mocking, uh, what that means, it, it's part of a line. Because um, God doesn't really mock in the way that uh, humans do. <clears throat> but anyway, um, so we have this negotiation that goes on. And then you're going to go to battle. So in... Uh, In verse 18, then they went along through the wilderness and compassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab. Okay, that's going to be just talking about the history. Um, and then so, verse 23, so now the Lord God of Israel hath dispossessed the Amorites from before us, before his people Israel, and shouldst thou possess it? Wilt thou possess that which Chemosh thy God hath given thee to possess? And now art thou anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel or did he ever fight against them? Now, we're going to say that this is um, a reference to, well, we have Balak, but, but he's connected to Balaam, right? Now, so did Balak fight against, um, he's the king of Moab, did he fight against Israel? 
Did he ever strive against them? When they were, before they conquered the land. I don't think he did. Didn't he just cur try to curse them? Yeah, he just tried to get them cursed. So he didn't fight against them. So is this correct that he didn't fight a against them? Well, he that would correct. be correct. But <laughs> there's, there's more to the story than that. That's right. There's more to the story. Yeah. Um, but anyway, this is, uh, the, this is of course, uh, the main point that's being made here by uh, Jephthah. So he's he's saying that that they didn't do that. So um, so he's saying if if Balak didn't fight against Israel, how are you going to fight them? And he says, while Israel dwelt in Heshbon in her towns and Aurora in her towns and in all the cities that be along the coast of Arnon, 300 years, why therefore did ye not recover them within that time? So he says, you know, Balak didn't fight against Israel. Of course, he did curse them. So there's, there's, there's a tie there that we need to, um, well, we did kind of examine it before. I don't think it's going to fit on our line here, but he's going to talk about these 300 years. So the 300 years is the last 300 years, right? Right. So how come you didn't recover the land in that period of time? So he's going to say, therefore I have not, not sinned against thee, but thou, um, but thou doest me wrong to war against me. The Lord of the the Lord, the judge, be judge this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. Albeit the king of the children of Ammon, hearken not unto the words of Jephthah, which he sent unto him. Right? So so we have this whole story. Um and one of the things that we can look at is that there is this, okay, so let's go back here. So we had 1111, and we're going to have the king of the children of Ammon sending, um, so first Jephthah sends messengers to the king of the children of Ammon, right? Then in verse 13, the king of the children of Ammon, he's going to answer, right? And then Jephthah is going to respond. Okay, and then I'm just seeing here this. So we're going to have messengers sent. Um, so let's go back here. I want to just get this clear. Um, so we get the king of the children of Ammon. So Jephthah sent messengers unto the children of Ammon. Right. That's verse 12. Then the king of the children of Ammon answered unto the messengers of Jephthah. Right. And then Jeff is going to send messengers again in verse 14. But then it says in verse 17, and Israel sent messengers unto the king of Edom. OK, so this is the king of Edom, not the king of Am Ammon. Right. So this oh, this is re rehearsing this history. Pardon me. So this is talking about the history of what happened i see okay so he's going to this is in his response he's going to mention that israel sent messengers unto the king of edom so he's just responding All right and then he's going to say israel sent messengers unto sion king of the amorites so he's going back over this old cold history okay now we see what's happening um 
So he's going to go through this whole history. So his response is fairly long. And the king of the children of Ammon does not hearken unto the words of Jephthah. And so then Jephthah is going to make a vow. So we need to figure out what this is and how this relates to these lines. Um, or does it, right? So does it relate to this line that we have, or is it some other line? Um, yeah, I'm just trying to sort this out. So if we were going to, let's go back to this chart for now. So we, we're saying that this message arrives, and this message, uh, the second message arrives on March 31st. That's Jeff. Um Presenting Judges 11.11. You're not sharing. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, judges 11.11, right? Judges 11.11 represents January 11th, 2020, and also March 31st, 2020, when we come to understand this. So this is an empowerment of a message, but when it's recognized is the arrival of a second message. That message is going to be uh, related to the symbolic use of time, and it's going to po point forward to March 27th, 2021. But I don't think we're going to put that on the line because it just has to do with understanding time. So there's events. So we have a formalization of this message. And where would this message be formalized? And where would it be empowered? So that's what we, we have to figure out. From what we read regarding this negotiation, this is going to happen after Judges 11.11. We're going to have this negotiation going on. So is there a negotiation that goes on, in a sense, within this movement? And is there a formalization that we could have of that message? Now, generally, when we look at a formalization, it's often, as in Miller's history, it's going to be what? What's the formalization in, in Millerite history of the, the first message and also the second message? Because there's two formalizations there. So the first message is formalized by Miller receiving his credentials. Right. Now, why right. do we why do we make that the formalization? Now, we have the increase of knowledge of the period of time from 1816 to 1818 when he, he gets this increase of knowledge or increase of light. And then it's going to be formalized when he's made a minister. Why is that a formalization? What does a formalization accomplish? Um, I'm sorry, repeat that question, the, the, the latter part of it. What does a formalization accomplish in, in, in connection with a line? Because you have a message arrives, but a message arrives isn't isn't enough, right? Right. You have so the arrival in seventy nine or eighty nine, ninety eight. I mean, yeah, Angela. I just said it bring, brings some clarity. Okay. Well, it gets to the point where the message is now delivered, right? That something is in place that the message can now be transmitted. Because Miller studying, he's, he's getting this increase of knowledge, but, but he's not delivering that message. So formalization is he now has his credentials, he can travel and, and, and Baptist churches and other churches are gonna accept him because he's a minister. Where before that would have been more difficult, especially in those days. And then the empowerment of that message, we know in Millerite history, is going to be the end of the second woe. Right? 
And then when we look at the formalization of the second message in Millerite history, that's going to be Boston. So, and, but that's going to be, there's going to be this increase of knowledge. There's going to be all these letters published and, and Snow studying. But in Boston, the message is now formalized. It's put into a package uh, that he can now present. Um, and, and so that message is going to begin uh, its work. So there's a work that's being done. When you get to Exeter, do people already know about Samuel Snow's message at Exeter? No. Yes, they do. Almost. There's actually a whole group of people who had studied what uh, Snow had done, right? So we have a wrong history of it. So you have to read my paper on August 15th on the Midnight Cry, because there it's clear that when Bates gets there and, and even uh, James White, that there are people who are already studying this um, and, and promoting the the tenth day of the seventh month as the end of the prophetic periods. One is many people were there at Boston, right? So they'd already heard the message at Boston, but at Exeter it's going to be empowered. So yeah, so Adventism has it wrong. Most Adventists just think all of a sudden snow comes up out of nowhere. They don't know anything about Snow's letters. They don't know anything about Boston. It's just, you know, there's this Exeter camp meeting and this guy had this light that he's going to share and it's just going to electrify the camp meeting. And, and for the first time, people are going to hear this and it all makes sense. That's uh, a distortion of history. But anyway, the point is the formalization is not the empowerment, but it's, it's the message is now being promulgated under a formalization. Right. So if we're going to. Look, well, yeah. So if we look at this history, we know one is we look at this line. We have a period of darkness. We know that that darkness has to do with the symbolic use of numbers and chronology and time because that's been rejected in the movement. And that is um, we are Seventh-day Adventists. We're sons of Gilead. Right. We're descendants of Gilead. But this movement has a message that is illegitimate. It's the son of a harlot, right? Which is the message of time. It's not to disparage it because it is a message from God, but it's just not considered legitimate, okay? And then you have um, this, um, the other issue that you have is, of course, Parminder and Tess's message, which is a false time message, right? Because they do have time, but their message is false. And, and Parminder is going to introduce that in 2012, but, you know, and it's, he's predicting something in 2014. And what we get in 2014 instead of the Sunday laws, we get an introduction into this movement of the symbolic use of time. Right. So Parminder predicted 2014. But what he predicted, he's always fighting against. And, and he does this in this deceitful way. Then we get this formalization, October 22, 2014. That week, at least, we have this um, message on time. And then... We have its empowerment, which is going to be January 11th, 2020, where we now have these dates laid out in the Levitical chiasm. And um, that's Judges 11.11. We now have, in a sense, Jephthah has, has agreed to go to battle, right? So... So Jeff is going to recognize this on March 31st, 2020. And then we have a formalization of this message. So we need to know what it is. And so the formalization of this message would have to be its promulgation. So the second angel would be formalized. 
I think it, it'd be pretty straightforward. So where would it be formalized? What date? Is that reasonable? Yes, it's the only one that I can see it would be. That's when it's going to be internationally understood. Right? So the message goes internationally on June 22nd. We, we put it in the Tennessean. And of course, there's the initial response to that article in the Tennessean on June 21st. And of course, what do we say internationally? Obviously, June 21st, 2020 is in Australia, it'd be June 22nd already. So, you know, we could say it's June 22nd in that sense. But uh, the point is, uh, it's really June 22nd. It's that starting date we had, June 24th, 22nd, 2014. We now have six days later, six days, six years later, um, June 22nd, 2020 with this formalization of this message. Now, the empowerment that does make sense. and the empowerment should be quite simple. Because that message the empowerment should be July 18th. Yeah, exactly. So the empowerment is July 18, 2020. And that's just pretty straightforward. Okay, so judges 11, 11 to 22 is the, is the formalization, is what uh, uh, Angela wrote there. So, so if we're gonna put this, we could say judges, well, either 11 or 12, but it's going to be end on Judges 22, 11, 22. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I'm saying because Jeff, I went, try to clarify and refine the whole thing to this king there that was skeptical yeah. on this. Well, it's, it's, gonna go, it's gonna go further though. I mean, he's gonna go all the way uh, to 27, 11, 27. That's what it looks like here. So, so 11, so I would, I would put this to 11, 27. So we're gonna go um, 11, 12 to 27. That's what I would do. <clears throat> and then we have um, July 18th. And of course, um, you know, that's going to be the empowerment. But this is, um, this is related to Jephthah's tragic vow. And so this fits in with what we've said before. So, so we know that he makes this vow, so that he says, he vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, if thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into my hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up, up for a burnt offering. So how does this relate to July 18th? And we know in verse 29, I'll go to the verses here. Um, so in verse 29, it says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead, and Manasseh, 
and passed over Mitzpah of Gilead. And from Mitzpah of Gilead, he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And then he vows a vow. So this vow is that he would offer um, that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So and then he's going to pass over and uh, unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the, the Lord delivered them into his hands. So what's all this passing over? I mean, this, this whole Jephthah's tragic vow can be a line itself, but... Um, we're going to say this relates to July 18th. It reminds me of when Jeff said whether July 18th is fulfilled or not the way some people thought it was going to be fulfilled. I'm, I'm quitting. This is, this is the end of my line. Right. So, so this is this is connected to the end of FFA. So the Jephthah daughter, not his wife, mm -hmm. but a daughter of Jephthah, mm -hmm. uh, that would be signifying FFA or the school of the prophets or something like that. Okay. Yeah, uh, that I mean, makes sense. Uh, I mean, not so sure that we can take it that direct, you know, but but basically this work. So in this conflict, basically Jephthah's putting everything on the line. He's he's not considering the consequences of this vow or what it could mean. But I would look at it, what happens, you know, after the publication of the article, we know that Jeff is going to go um, talking to an Islamic uh, teacher. He's going to go on YouTube, right? And, you know, and Jeff says to the guy, you know, if the, if the prediction fails, you know, I'll be here. You can have an interview with me. Of course, Jeff doesn't do that. Which I was a little bit disappointed in because Jeff should have followed up with that, but he chose not to. Well, didn't he didn't he give that guy the opportunity? I mean, when he said that, uh, and I don't think the guy ever followed up on it, or did he? Um, well, I don't know all the details of what happened afterwards, but uh, I think that that Jeff didn't respond afterwards, after July 18th. So that's my reading of it. But I've looked at the video and the chat and discussion and so forth, and people are saying, why isn't, why isn't you know, Pippinger here to explain uh, why his prediction failed? But most of it's mockery, right? So I do comment on that video regarding it. Um, but anyway, the, the point here is that we have this vow and I'm not going to say that's Jeff's vow, you know, per se, but but it is related to this movement because Jephthah is not Jeff. Jephthah is this message of symbolic use of time, which relates to July 18th. So July 18th becomes this this date that we focus on using this symbolic use of numbers. It's probably the best way to look at it. So we focus upon. All of, all of our energies, all of that we have done, all of the studying comes to bear on July 18th. And so we, we, in a sense, put all of our eggs in one basket, which, which I wasn't necessarily happy with, <clears throat> in that I understood that there was so many implications for Adventism and the understanding of prophecy that we had found that our focus should have been more upon, you know, the book of Ezra, right? 
all of these different studies that we did to understand them. And after July 18th, of course, the movement isn't interested in looking at any of this, generally speaking. Definitely FFA is not interested in it. They're, they're not interested in Adventism, like seeing, okay, sure, we, we were wrong about July 18th, the event that was going to happen, but it doesn't mean that we were wrong about everything. And, and we need to know why we were wrong. Um, to me, that's been the, the, the whole purpose of all of our studies is to, to vindicate Adventism. Is Adventism founded on a solid uh, foundation? Is it, you know, is it built on a solid foundation? And so I think that this, this tragic vow uh, relates to this offering up of this daughter to the end of FFA. Right, because basically we're just putting it all on the line, the whole history of FFA. So Jeff says, whether it occurs or not, it's the end of FFA. That, in a sense, is the vow, though it's not just Jeff making that vow. It's really because we placed everything upon July 18th, 2020, that inevitably... Um, that's going to be the end of FFA either way, right? And Jeff could see that, so he understood what was happening in that sense. But it, but it is kind of a, from my perspective, we weren't measured in how we approached our understanding of prophecy. I understand we had to make the warning to Nashville. But we had the opportunity to recognize that our prediction may fail. And to me, that should have been a central part of, of, our, of our message. Now, when we did the website, remember, I had written a paper on the mind calendar related to the 777 structure. And I'd sent that paper because originally all the work that I had done for the website was rejected. That is, I'd taken all the articles other people had written and put them into a format with footnotes and diagrams and everything that they <coughs> put on a single web page. What, what do I? Sorry, sorry. Okay. So they could be put onto a single web page that would be easily, uh, you know, gone through you would have you know the the table of context contents and all your footnotes you would be able to click on them and move back and forth through the paper and the footnotes it'd be a simple web page the, the best type of web page as far as i'm concerned for for reading information um and, and but that was all set aside instead jeff wrote an article and then they added pdfs and of course my first pdf was rejected because it had footnotes with links to web pages and they didn't want that for some reason I'm not sure the reasoning that's because it, they couldn't make it work they were having trouble making that work with uh, clicking on links inside of uh, web pages i remember that from that's what um, they said that's not that's, logical. that's what the boy said um his son yeah that's not logical iran does that make any sense to you Because you you do web pages. Uh, if you have a web page, you should be able to link to different things. Yeah, it, it happens all the time. I mean, to me, it's a pretty simple thing to have a page where you have a link and you just go to that link, and then you can go back to the page you just uh, came from, right? So the reason behind that is this is my conspiracy theory explanation is they didn't want um, to be linked to other people uh, for, for other reasons. And, and, and I know in my case, they didn't want to be linked to my academia site. That is, they didn't want people going to read my papers. They wanted to be able to control the content. And so when I sent my paper, which also had links, they rejected the paper. I took out all of the links 
And they posted my paper and it was up for a day and then they took it down. Right. So they didn't want that paper on the Mayan calendar that said our prediction may fail. They didn't want that on the, the website. And that should have been a major part of our argument. We're making this prediction. We're giving this warning. But it's a part of a line of failed predictions. And it could fail. But just to be safe, if you live in Nashville, don't be there on July 18th, 2020. Go somewhere else. But that was, it wasn't done. Um, and so I think it was a tragic vow. The position that was taken by the movement was destructive to the movement. That is, the daughter had to be sacrificed. Does that make sense to people? Any thoughts or criticisms? That appears logical. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, so so we can see then um, if we go back to the lines. I mean, we can take this whole se se segment in in Judges eleven, and we can say, well, this relates to Jephthah's tragic vow. Now, and we and so we can even take this vow and we can put it on a line, and that line. Uh, would include, you know, the sale of the school of the prophets and, and all those things that we've talked about, the listing of the school 187 days before July 18, 2021, and the sale of the school 187 days after July 18, 2020. So, so there's other things that we could put in there. But, but that would be a separate line. What we can say is this is Judges 20... I guess it'd be 29 to um, now there was another thing that we had here uh, that was you're, you're not sharing again. I'm not sharing. I know I'm sharing the, the Bible trying okay. to find out where we, where we go to here. Okay. Cause there was some symbols here. Uh, she sent away for two months, right? And then they're going to lament yearly um, the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadites, four days in a year. And I know we talked about this, but why is it four days? What, what was the symbol there? Yeah, that's the that's the generations. Four generations, or the three angels' message plus one. I mean, what do you want to go for? Well, I mean, it could be four years, right? A day for a year. Yes. Okay. Now we we had a discussion about whether she was actually sacrificed, or whether this just was. Um. She wasn't going to get married and she was, you know, um, basically dedicated to the temple. Um, but how is that burning with fire? Burnt with fire. Well, I'm just saying because he may have thought it was an animal that was going to come. Right. He wasn't planning to have his daughter or any person come. Right. So so there's there's a disagreement regarding this. Um, how we would look at this. But she's going to bewail her virginity, not her life. Right? Well, that's what it says. Yeah. And so at the end of the two months, she returned unto her father who did with her according to his vow, which he had vowed, and she knew no man, and it was a custom in, in Israel. So it doesn't say, and he killed her. But she knew no man, right? So it seems like that she's 
bewailing her virginity because that's that's the substitute that's being made uh, instead of offering her, which would have been, of course, contrary to the law. Uh, I mean, a human sacrifice would not be uh, according to God's will. And then it was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadites four days in a year. And she's going to she's going to bewail her virginity for two months. So. So it seems like that's what what she has done. But I know some people would take it that she bewails her virginity because she never has children, but she's still going to die. But. Um, well, there's no that's... confirmation as to that he had burnt her with fire. So, I right. mean. Well, he's not going to. What you're yeah. thinking is plausible. Yeah. Because he just says, I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So this he's thinking this is going to be an animal that comes when he goes uh, to his home. Now it says, whoever cometh forth of the doors. Um, now that would be, of course, probably he's thinking about the gate, not the door of the house, right? Because even though it says the doors of the house, that that can refer to the entire not just the building of what we would call the house, but his his estate, right? So he's thinking, you know, when I come up to my farm, you know, the first animal that comes up to me, you know, comes out of those that the gate to greet me, I'm gonna offer it up as a burnt offering. And and he wouldn't think of it as a dog even or anything like that, because he's not gonna offer a dog as a burnt offering or a human. It would be a clean animal. Right. So that's what he's thinking in his mind when he makes this vow. He doesn't realize the consequences uh, that could result. So then it's going to be his daughter. So and it's his only child. Right. So that's going to be um, the end of his line. At this point. Right. He's not expecting that he's going to have more children or whatever. Well, that's the logical effect. Yeah. So, so that's his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. So when he sees her, he rents his clothes, right? And it says, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought, brought me very low, and thou art one of them that trouble me. Art one, thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. So I don't think he's going to offer up as an offering. I think he just recognizes that if it's a human, then she's dedicated to God and she can't have children. So, so that's going to be the end of FFA. That's the way that I would look at this. So we're going to take this, this, whole, this whole story from 1129 to 1140. And we put that on the line. Just because we've been putting these uh, verses here. Terrible chamber. Okay. <clears throat> so then we have December 6, 2020, and um, now we could say, that, so I put that hole here, this vow, but we probably could split this up. Um, but, but I'm just going to put it like that for now. I haven't decided how to divide it. Um, so that's just going to be the empowerment, but it's also going to be the December 6, 2020 declaration. So, so in this period of time, from July 18th to December 6th, is when the results of this vow are going to be felt, right? 
So, I mean, we could even, you know, uh, put some other date up there, like when maybe Jeff made this statement or whatever. Um, but we're just going to put a July 18, 2020 there to December 6th, 2020. That's where this vow is then in place. And with that failure of that prediction, then we're going to have the result. Okay. Now, remember, we're, we're trying to understand the lines here. So as we've, we've constructed this line, we can see that this is consistent with all that we have done before. That these, these verses fit into a line. And one of the main aspects of understanding a line is understanding the darkness. And that you have a two, a three-step testing prophetic message with the first and second angels' messages, leading to the third, which develops two classes of worshipers. It's going to demonstrate them, and that's going to happen on December 6, 2020. So this line of Jephthah, it becomes, because we have it in the line of the judges, right? So the, the idea is that we have these lines. Go back here. So we have the judges' line. And we're saying that Jephthah is this December 6, 2020, because this judge's line looks like this, right? And so Jephthah is this formalization of a message on this bigger line. So, so, we, so when we look at this bigger line, this second message relates to July 18, 2020, and the aftermath of it. And, and you see that it ends on July 11th, 2023, or January 11th, 2023, pardon me. And January 11th, 2023 is um, going to be Samson, right? I know I have a different font here. Um, and, and with this judge's line, the way that we have it, I mean, we could maybe label these things differently but we have a second angel that arrives in the judge's line that's J july 18 2020 so it's part of that line of jephthah but it's relating to a bigger line which means that there's actually a, a different period of darkness right so when we look at each way mark and we zoom in as we have been doing and we create a new line that line is going to relate to some message, actually three messages, that all begin with the first angel's message that has this increase of light and develops into finally this third message. So on December 6, 2020, we have this formalization of a message. So what is the darkness? What is the judge's line about? What is the period of darkness? And because we're going to have 9-11 there at the beginning. So what's the period of darkness of the judge's line? Do we remember what we had as the darkness? Why these messages? Um, our, the darkness that we've been, that I think that we've been experiencing is not understanding how the lines are here recently, but in the beginning, um, it was understanding of Miller's rules. Okay. So there's quite a few things tied up with it, right? So we know, for instance, Jeff had an understanding of the lines prior to 9-11. But he, in the understanding the repeat of history, what he had not understood is that our repeat of history is the Sunday law. And so 9-11 is the Sunday law, right? And Jeff came to kind of recognize that afterwards. 
But but we're in the history of the Sunday law. We're repeating Miss Millerite history, but we're actually experiencing the Sunday law history that, that Ellen White saw on her line. Because that's the angel of Revelation 18 coming down at the Sunday law. But for Ellen White's line, it's just this point of time, the Sunday law. Right. But now we can see we're in the Sunday law. The Sunday law arrived at 9-11. But it's progressive. Establishing that it has its own line if we zoom into that particular right. way mark. So as we look at this line, as we look at it unfolding, we can see how that's relating, how the history of the judges line is, is the history of this movement. In our understanding of the Sunday law, that is, it's the understanding of what Jeff's message was in all of its implications and the role and the part we have to play in getting the Adventist church ready for the Sunday law proper, right? The event that we call the Sunday law. But we're in that time already, right? It's already unfolding. We're making our choices. We don't just wake up one day and there's a Sunday law. We're going through an experience, a line, a history, making these choices day by day. So anyway, we have to finish now. We'll come back to this tomorrow. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, please be with us today. Thank you for what you've shown us this morning. Help us to be faithful to the light you have given and to continue to teach us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.